Coming up on Mayo Clinic Q&A. The exciting news is that we have three vaccines now available to Americans. And even better is that the supply for these during March and April will dramatically increase. Having a third vaccine brings us one step closer to protecting the American public against COVID. But should the public wait for a single dose vaccine? If there is a vaccine, any of the three of them, if there is a vaccine available to you and you are offered that vaccine, please consider taking that vaccine. Welcome everyone to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. Thanks for being here today. It is March the 1st, 2021. Can you believe it is March already? Mm. Those of you who join us regularly know that on this broadcast, we are trying to give you the latest in COVID-19, both related to the virus and vaccines. So today we're going to answer some questions from our listener mailbag. You keep us supplied, thank you. Dr. Greg Poland is here with me again today. He's our infectious disease, vaccine and virology expert. Thanks for being here, Greg. You bet, boy, March 1st, it's hard to believe we've been doing this for over a year. Isn't that something? That's really amazing. I think I've lost track of where we are in numbers, but uh, our producer, will, Jen, will keep us updated at some point. Yeah. <laughs> um, Greg, tell us about last week, Johnson & Johnson news. Yeah, this was a, a really interesting experience for me. Uh, Johnson & Johnson, actually the, the vaccine side, Janssen, uh, asked me to be a consultant to them uh, for presenting the clinical case in regards to the risk and the benefit of the vaccine. And, and I did that on their behalf. Of course, they pay us for our time, um, but I did that on, on their behalf. It was a, about a nine hour meeting to the, to the FDA Federal Advisory Committee, but 100% of them voted, unanimous vote, to approve that vaccine by U, EUA. So the exciting news is that we have three vaccines now available to Americans under EUA. And, and even better is that the supply for these uh, during March and April will dramatically increase. So we are, uh, you know, as I've often characterized it, we're in a race between virus and vaccine. And so again, with everything in me, if there is a vaccine, any of the three of them, if there is a vaccine available to you and you are offered that vaccine, please consider taking that vaccine. Well, that this is wonderful. Way out. I'm sorry, Greg, repeat that this, because I cut this, you off. This is our way out of this pandemic. That's wonderful, Greg. Thank you for sharing that. Um, I did want to ask you a question that comes from one of our listeners. We're going to dive right into the mailbag now. The first question is pertinent to what you just said. There are three vaccines now. If someone receives one of the vaccines, has the complete, uh, whether it be two doses or one that are required, can they later, when vaccines are more available, have another type of vaccine that works in a different way? And should they? So uh, I, I suspect a number of the questions that, that I get from patients and from the public will fit into this. Where, where I have to say, we just don't have data. This is one of those questions. We don't have any data on efficacy or the safety of doing that. Now, what do we know from other vaccines? That's likely to be safe, right? We don't have any data to the contrary. The question is, will it be necessary? Um, and at least at this point, no, there's no reason to you know, get part of your regimen from this vaccine and part from another. What about a booster dose? Um, again, we don't have data and that's a really practical, important question. I love our listeners. They, they ask the clinically right. practical questions and often they are the very research ideas that we're working on. So in fact, there are studies that will start that will give us the data to answer that definitively. I have a feeling we're going to be getting a lot of expert opinion from you today, Greg. Yeah, and that's the right way to put it. You know, there's the science of medicine where we have data that tells us this is the best thing to do. And there's the art of medicine, which is where we don't have data. We extrapolate from we, what we know. And it's very fair to put it that way, expert opinion. 
There's been a lot of talk about the fact that most adults will be able to be vaccinated maybe by summertime. Can we get herd immunity if we aren't vaccinating children? Another really good question. Um, my guess is no. Now it depends on what we mean by children. We know that with these variants, that they are these variant viruses, they're infecting children at younger and younger age groups and increasing the viral load. So that is probably true, at least on what little data we have, down to about age 9, 10, 12, somewhere around there. So it's important that they get uh, immunized. What the vaccine manufacturers are working on is reducing that age all the way to a few months of age. So I suspect what this is going to take is for nearly all of us, all, literally all of us to get these vaccines before we are at a level where masks are off and we resume life. Another of our listeners wants to know if it will be safe to hug their grandchildren. Yeah, I know. I know how you want to do that. And, and my heart goes out. I want to hug my own kids, but we can't yet. Um, now, it does depend on what you mean by grandchild. If you're saying a healthy adult who has gotten both doses of vaccine properly and a very young child who's predominantly been at home, hug away. If you're talking about a junior high, high school, college age um, uh, grandchild who has not been immunized, you need to be in a mask even though you've been immunized and ideally they should be in a mask too. That brings us to our next question from a listener, Greg. Uh, if the vaccine works, why do I still have to wear a mask? People are boycotting the vaccine because uh, they're upset that they still have to wear a mask or believe that perhaps that means that the vaccines don't really work. What is your response? Really good question, Helena, and, and a really practical one that uh, is easy to be misinformed about, and that is happening in the public. No vaccine is perfect. I'd be the first one as a vaccinologist to say that. There's no such thing as a vaccine that always induces 100% protection. It's not possible. The question is, does it induce high levels of protection in otherwise healthy people? And the answer to that is yes. But until probably in the order of 90%, and it's questionable whether we can reach that with people rejecting it. But until we have that level of high rate of immunization, we have to keep wearing masks. Otherwise, for those people who don't have full, but have partial protection, who come in contact with somebody who has not been immunized, rejected the vaccine, and gets infected, will just keep spreading it. It's like a chain that goes out. And so the more of us that get immunized, the better. There, there's one piece of important data for this. In the city of Manus, Brazil, they had 80% immunity and still cases were accumulating. So it is apparent that herd immunity for a virus as transmissible as this is going to be somewhere north of 80%. Well, I can tell that this vaccine situation is a little bit complex because we have lots and lots of questions about vaccines for you today, so we'll keep going. The next question is, if an individual has already had COVID, do they need to get the vaccine? And how long should they wait after their uh, illness before they receive it, if they should? Uh, this is These are such tough questions because there is no black and white answer. In other words, Helena, you're young and healthy. We give you- Oh, um, young, I love that, Greg, thank you. <laughs> well, if you, if you, God forbid, were to develop COVID, you would have an excellent immune response that would be long lasting. We don't know how long, but long lasting. Now take an 85 year old person who might be more frail, has a number of medical conditions, as we get past our 60s and 70s and 80s, the ability of the disease and of the vaccine to induce long-lived protection decreases. So, you know, what, what 
one piece of data do we know about this? Well, it involves the AstraZeneca vaccine, which is not yet available in the US. But a brand new study shows that if you had COVID, and it depends on whether you were symptomatic or asymptomatic, if you had COVID and you got a dose of vaccine, it could increase your antibody levels by 400 to 600 fold, uh, on occasion, even a thousand fold. So you ask yourself the question, could we delay past what our current recommendation is? If you've had COVID, wait 90 days or more. This is a supply issue, not a safety issue, and then get your vaccines. The question that's been raised is, Maybe some people could wait a lot longer than 90 days, increasing our ability to protect other members of the population. And maybe they only need one dose of vaccine when that time comes that their immunity falls. These are still open questions, but at least one study using the AstraZeneca vaccine has suggested a definitive yes to a, a proposition like that. So right now in the US, the recommendation is wait 90 days and then whatever vaccine and its associated regimen you're gonna get, that's what you should do. And I could imagine that a recommendation to wait 90 days being somewhat anxiety provoking. I think some individuals feel if I don't take my opportunity when I'm called up to get my vaccine or notified that I may miss out. Yeah, and, and I do understand that, but uh, I think I can be very reassuring here. The vaccine supply chain is dramatically increasing, not decreasing. We now have three vaccines uh, very soon here toward the end of spring, early summer, I predict we'll have a fourth one. And the two big manufacturers right now, Moderna and Pfizer, are, are talking about another 100 million doses. So I honestly, at this point, I honestly do not see an issue with that going forward. Well, I'm still smiling, Greg, because you called me young earlier. So uh, <laughs> that's great. Just keep that, keep that you coming. You have gray hair like me. <laughs> well, you know, there are ways to cover gray hair. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, the next question. How likely is it that the COVID vaccine or vaccines will be seasonal like a flu vaccine is? Yeah, I think many of us that work in this field feel that it is very likely. That is, it will become endemic, something more akin to influenza, where we'll be getting booster doses. Now, like influenza, the really interesting scientific question for us will, will be, do I get a booster of the same vaccine I got, or will it be with a variant? To answer that question, there are studies already started. Moderna has started it, has sent a variant vaccine to the NIH to begin testing and answering that very question. Uh, Greg, I'm going to ask you to clarify for me. When you say variant, do you mean uh, vaccine specifically for these variants of COVID or a different type of vaccine? No, no, uh, same technology, but using the S protein of the variant virus rather than the original virus. Okay, so the booster would be a slightly different vaccine right. than was received originally in that case. That, yeah, and that could well be, again, uh, I'll compare it to what we do with influenza vaccine where every year we shuffle what's in the vaccine. My guess is that could happen with uh, COVID-19 vaccines. In the last week, Greg, here at Mayo Clinic, I've gotten two emails about the need for O-positive blood. I'm sure that blood banks around the country are in need of uh, various uh, blood types. And so this uh, question from a listener is, is it safe to donate blood after being vaccinated? Yes, absolutely. In other words, uh, and I've gotten questions like this, would somehow taking a unit of blood from me decrease my immunity? No. Remember that, in fact, we do that in patients who have recovered from COVID infection and harvest their plasma to use for other patients. So no concerns or fears there. And safe for the recipient as well. Yes. Okay. 
Uh, this next question, a uh, listener would like to know what the relationship is between getting the vaccine and displaying antibodies on a blood test, either um, when they're donating blood or otherwise. And is the, this any different in a person who is immune suppressed? Would there be differences? Yes. Made? yes. So what this question really strikes at the heart of is, do we have a blood marker that can tell us you're protected or not protected? We think, we think that that blood marker is likely to be neutralizing antibody, but it's only one part of the immunity story. Probably equally important is cellular immunity, which is not standardly measured. Now, what we know is that people with cellular immunity can very rapidly develop uh, protection when they're re-exposed. So that's a good thing. The question is, if I've not been uh, infected with COVID-19, what we call COVID-19 naive, and then I go in and get my vaccine, and let's say I am immunocompromised and I have no antibody response, am I protected? My guess is you might be protected, but it's probably very low level protection and might not be protective at all. We don't know with clarity. You might have some element of cellular immunity. You might not because we don't and can't measure that very well as a standard clinical test. So a lot of questions around that. It does cause a lot of anxiety. And I understand that for people who are either immunocompromised because of a disease they have or a treatment they're taking. And we're working hard to get those kind of data. Sounds like another reason to continue masking and hands, face, and space, Absolutely. because we don't really know how protected some individuals are, are Absolutely. even if vaccinated. Next question, should transplant uh, patients who have received organ uh, transplants or uh, I suppose uh, um, bone marrow transplants be, or stem cell transplants be vaccinated? Um, and is there any fear of rejecting um, what the organ that they have received. Yeah, so the tr truth of the matter is nobody has done a study of people receiving a, a bone marrow or solid organ transplant. They were excluded from the phase three clinical trials as would normally be the case. So the truth is we don't have any data on that. Now, the other side of the coin, and this is the expert opinion side of it is, we have no data that would suggest harm in a case like that. So the general expert opinion consensus is that yes, we would offer vaccine to those individuals with of course no guarantee about what level of protection they may or may not uh, achieve. Those studies have started. In fact, we're starting one at Mayo Clinic uh, to better understand those answers. Um, in regards to the other part of the question, Helena, about rejection, yes. again, we have no evidence of that and, and no underlying biologic theory that would really make us concerned about that possibility. Uh, but again, you know, you're, you're better informed when we have uh, a, a lot of clinical trial data about that, which I hope we'll have in the coming months. We have a lot of uh, questions about people who are immune compromised today. No. Next is an autoimmune question. Uh, a listener would like to know if those with autoimmune diseases such as scleroderma, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis are at a higher risk for side effects from the vaccines. Yeah, we have no evidence of that, of higher risk of side effects. And there were many people who did have various kinds of autoimmune diseases who were in the clinical trials. And uh, it, the, how well they fared in the trial had little to do with their underlying disease, more to do with what treatment they were or were not on. As you know, some of the disease modifying agents are actually in a sense immunosuppressive. And those could be reasons they may not develop as high of antibody level, but no, no safety issues. Nobody has seen or reported a reactivation or a worsening of, of an autoimmune disease due to receipt of these vaccines. Well, we have another listener who wrote in and said that they have a 
painful case of shingles or herpes zoster, should they uh, be getting their COVID vaccine? And incidentally, I do hope that you are feeling better. That's a difficult thing to struggle with. Yeah, uh, our sympathies to that to that listener. It's a it's a miserable disease. It is, by the way, uh, the reason for the recommendation of the inactivated uh, shingles vaccine. It's two doses with very high efficacy on the order of 85, 90 plus percent. Um, generally, and again, this isn't a, something that's specifically been studied, but the general recommendation across all vaccines is that we generally wait until recovery from an acute illness. Part of that is we don't want to confuse uh, side effects or uh, attribute side effects to a vaccine where that is not the case. So my recommendation in this case would be to recover from that and then get your COVID vaccine. Well, and then how do they fit in the shingles vaccine? This individual may also need to receive their shingles vaccine. Should that be first, same time, COVID first? Yeah, that really depends on the clinical circumstances. So generally, we say wait six to 12 months after an episode of shingles because shingles disease is in itself boosting of shingles immunity. Um, so they've got plenty of time to do that. But again, depending on their particular clinical situation, that's really a question to be discussed with their healthcare provider. Well, this next question, Greg, I had read about this in the paper as well, that if individuals are allergic to um, a laxative uh, called Miralax, polyethylene glycol, that they should not receive a COVID vaccine. True and why? Yeah, a very, very practical question, Helena. Thank you for asking that because it comes up and I haven't thought to, uh, to, to mention it. I don't think we've gotten the question before, but the two mRNA vaccines do contain PEG or polyethylene glycol. The Johnson & Johnson vaccine does not contain PEG, but contains a compound somewhat related called polysorbate 80. So people who have had documented allergic reactions to PEG-containing um, uh, uh, medications, and Miralax would be one of those, would, uh, I think, be best served by seeing an allergist understanding. As you know, a lot of times patients believe they have an allergy to something, and they didn't have an allergy. They may have had a side effect or something but get that investigated in order to understand whether or not they could safely get that vaccine. And there's some testing that can be done, but the short answer to your question is if they've had a documented allergic reaction to a PEG containing product, then we would probably defer from giving them uh, without further testing and, and consultation an mRNA based vaccine. I think that's really common in practice that we see many people with very long allergy lists, but when you really look, they're actually sensitivity. So it is uh, wise to know and even to see an allergist, as you said, to be tested because there's some medications that it's going to be uh, difficult not to receive in your lifetime. Well said, yes. Let's move on to long haulers or long COVID uh, mm -hmm. syndrome. There's a new little acronym for this, P-A-S-C, all in capitals. Is that pass C? I'm not sure how I'm supposed to pronounce that. Yeah. What does it stand for? That stands for post-acute sequelae of SARS-CoV-2. <laughs> Leave it to us physicians to invent it long. Be easy. It has to be a big long term. Yeah, you know, I, I kind of like the term long haul or long COVID because everybody knows what we mean there. We don't have to kind of mystify it. Um, but basically, it's getting at the idea. And, you know, interestingly, <clears throat> there's a recent study from the University of uh, Washington showing that about 30% of their patients who developed documented COVID had symptoms persisting, are you ready for this, as long as nine months. Oh, wow. And that can happen even with very mild disease. So, you know, it's also one of those points of misinformation, perhaps particularly younger people who say, you know what, even if I got, you know, mild uh, uh, COVID here, I'm, I'm not going to get hospitalized or die. They're probably right. 
but that doesn't preclude them from developing, and we're learning a lot about this, uh, developing persistent symptoms of fatigue, headache, what patients describe as brain fog and other things. And, and I would urge our listeners, uh, our, any healthcare providers that are listening, these are real symptoms. They deserve to be taken seriously. And NIH, in fact, said over the weekend that they were going to um, uh, invest substantial funds into research studies to better understand this. So uh, it's incumbent upon patients to let physicians know about that symptoms and for physicians to design, you know, rehab and recovery programs that assist those patients in getting back to their baseline if we can. Well, Greg, I think our listeners are always one step ahead of us because we have a question. Can you have persistent symptoms if you develop COVID and you've been vaccinated? And does having received the vaccine lessen the intensity or the, the likelihood of that occurring if it can occur? I'm not exactly sure I understand the question, but let me try to divide it up. So the question is, if you got COVID vaccine, and later developed COVID. Correct. Less likely to develop long haul symptoms. Right. We think so, because in general, if you had any breakthrough infection, it's likely to be much lower level. You could still develop it, as I explained just a moment ago, but less likely so. Now, what about the scenario of does having had the disease and then getting the vaccine? protect you against the long haul symptoms. The, the issue here and the, the symptoms that develop seem to be a function of not only the hyperinflammatory responses from the disease, but some of the end organ damage that's done by the virus. For example, I uh, heard anecdotally just recently of a case of somebody who recovered from COVID infection went to a high altitude place, which they normally have no difficulty with, couldn't tolerate the higher altitude. Interesting. That raises the question in my mind, is there some pulmonary uh, scarring or fibrosis that occurred as a result of that? We certainly do see some decreased functionality in people post COVID. Uh, and so some of these symptoms that develop, I think are related to the to the virus, not to the vaccine. And again, by getting a vaccine and preventing infection, you're reducing and modifying the potential or any severity of those symptoms. Well, our focus has been so much on vaccines lately that we haven't talked a lot about treatment for COVID-19, excuse me. Uh, a listener has a question about ivermectin as a potential treatment. Yeah. So, you know, this has come up with a, a lot of, you know, it came up with hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, ivermectin, MMR vaccine, BCG vaccine, and you name it, um, uh, uh, questions. If there's evidence in the laboratory of a decrease in viral load or replication, that's enough evidence to say, let's test it and find out. And so uh, the NIH, the Gates Foundation, and others are in fact doing a study looking at a number of these medications to answer these questions. If ivermectin worked, it would be really great because it's a very inexpensive medication and would offer a therapy, particularly in uh, uh, lower economic situated countries uh, for that treatment. It's less than a dollar a dose. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, so it would, would be beneficial if it were true. The data, as I have seen them thus far, does not support uh, the idea that we would treat outside of a clinical trial. So let's get the clinical trial data first. Let's not make the mistake that was made with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin and a variety of other things. So the key thing is, as you and I know and pledged, first do no harm. We find out, are these adding benefit or adding side effects? Unfortunately, with hydroxychloroquine, it harmed people. And Isn't often, that 
doesn't that just say a lot, Greg, about how far we've come in a year, that a year ago we were desperate to find solutions yeah. for what do we do now that people are contracting this? Yeah. And uh, we've come a long way. Well, and you know, we've learned a lot about uh, if we're going to use convalescent plasma, for example, the need to use it early and high titer plasma. We've learned an awful lot. I've done some podcasts on the mo neutralizing monoclonal antibodies as therapy uh, in COVID-19. We've learned a lot about using two monoclonals rather than a single drug and instituting that very early on. We're now beginning even to move the science forward to say, are there situations where we might in a preventive rather than a therapeutic posture, give some of these therapies? So. Um, it is amazing to me uh, with international collaboration. Uh, you know, as, as I said in a recent editorial that, that I just submitted, when you um, focus and fund research, the scientific community can do just short of miraculous things. But the key is focus and funding. Wow, lots of collaborating has gone on. Uh, well, well, we have dug deep into the a mailbag today, Greg. Do you have any last words for us or thoughts? You know, uh, as I often do, encouraging people, what we have seen is that people are decreasing their travel. They are wearing masks. They're following the hands, face, space, and vaccinate uh, paradigm, and it's working. We had 50,000 infections yesterday. Now, remember, we were touching on 300,000 a day. Wow. The key here, the key here, and I'm going to inject my scientific opinion, is that uh, those early gains are already starting to shift with increased number of cases as states and businesses begin to relax restrictions, in my estimation, too early. We've seen over and over again around the world that when you do that, prior to very high rates of immunization and continued mask wearing, unless you can find a way to literally seal a country's borders, you will have a recurrence. This is especially risky with these variants. Um, you know, there's a, there's a preprint out just showing as one example that the AstraZeneca vaccine essentially offered minimal to no protection against the so-called South African variant. So we cannot be premature in our early celebrations. We have to kind of continue to stay the course. And if we do that, we will find our way out of this, but not quite yet. But now is not the time to let down our guard. Exactly. It is okay. all of us together. Well, thanks for being here today, Greg, and answering lots of great questions. Thank you so much. Our thanks to Dr. Greg Poland, infectious disease expert, virologist, and a vaccine expert from the Mayo Clinic here answering our mailbag again today. I hope that you learned something today. I know that I did. And we wish you a wonderful day. Keep submitting your questions. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org, then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well. We hope you'll offer a review of this and other episodes when the option is available. Comments and questions can also be sent to Mayo Clinic News Network at mayo.edu.